Metaphor Refantasio just released, and I'm here to help you master its combat system. I'll guide you in maximizing your damage output by teaching you how to double your turns and take full advantage of all the systems that Metaphor has to offer. This video is sponsored by Sega and Atlas, so if you're interested in finally purchasing the game, it's available now and you can do so by using the link in the description down below. If you're still on the fence though, there is a demo that you can play. And if that doesn't push you to try the game out, you also have the Metacritic score of 94. So it's one of the highest reviewed games of the year. And then we also have high GameSpot and IGN scores. So this is a game you're definitely not gonna wanna miss. So while you download the demo, we can go ahead and get started with our combat guide. To open up, I'm going to explain how the turn order works. And now for those of you that have played other Shin Megami Tensei games with the press turn battle system, this may be review for you. But for those that haven't, I'm going to explain this as if you had no prior knowledge. If you look to the bottom right of the screen, you're going to see our character icons and to the left of that we have numbers, which are going to effectively be the turn order. But it does deviate and get a little bit trickier than just having the numbers there once we get into these fights that are going to last multiple turns. Right now we have Stroll going first, the main character going second, and Hulkenberg going third. And this turn order is something that can be manipulated based on whoever has the highest agility, which is something we see in other JRPGs. But you can see that based on my party, we have Stroll having the highest, main character second highest, and Hulkenberg being the third. Now I did mention earlier it's going to deviate when it comes time to pass our turn, so I will just get to that point so I can give you a good example of what that's going to look like. And basically what's going to happen, I'm going to yield this just to prove a point, and I'm going to yield this to prove a point. So basically the way that this is going to work is that when my next turn comes up, the person who is going to start that turn is going to be whoever is next in the turn order after I use my last crystal. So right now I'm going to attack with Stroll, and next in the turn order is going to be the main character. And so after this attack, it's going to come back to my turn and the main character is going to be the one to lead us. And so fast forward, yada, 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 stun, stun, stun. It's back to me. Boom, main character. Now, an instance where this could matter could be when you have one full crystal and you are the last person going and you can choose to attack with the character whose turn it is now or yield your turn to the next character and have them attack. Yielding your turn to that next character is going to allow you to manipulate who is going to open up the turn from the next wave after your enemy takes their turn. So let me see if I can get us in a scenario where I can show you guys this exact setup. Let me kill one of these. We'll go with this guy. And so we got got rid of him. We have one crystal left. I'm going to yield my turn to prove this point. So basically in this situation now, I could attack with the main character. I'd probably kill it, but I can attack with the main character. And then when it's my turn again, it'll be Hulkenberg's turn, or I can yield to Hulkenberg, attack with her, and then when it's my turn again, it'll be Stroll's turn. Now, to prove this point, I'm just going to attack with the main character because we already started where Stroll started at the beginning. Hopefully I don't kill them, okay, good. So now when it's my turn again, if I don't die, because these things hit pretty hard, <laughs> these things hit pretty hard, we can see it's going to be Hulken, please, no? Well, that kind of messed up the example, but you get the point. It's Hulkenberg's turn. The game does a good job explaining the crystal system, but I'm going to do a quick recap just to get you up to speed. You can see we have three characters. So at the top, we have three crystals that correspond with that. If one of our characters were to die, every turn we're only going to get two crystals. And then in the future, when we have four characters in our party, we're going to spawn four crystals per turn. Different actions consume a different amount of crystals. So we can see with the synthesis attack, I can spend all three crystals. I could spend two crystals, or if I just do a basic melee attack or an archetype attack, as long as it doesn't hit a weakness, it's gonna consume one crystal. Now, things that consume less than one crystal would be yielding, which is gonna consume half a crystal, which means that when it's my turn, if I just do this attack, it's gonna consume the other half of the crystal. So yielding allows me to split it in half and attack with the next character. And the next thing that's going to allow you to use half a crystal is going to be hitting the enemy's weakness. So we can see right here, it's going to only take half of the crystal and I'm going to be able to do a full attack with the other half on Stroll. Now, why this is going to matter is because essentially on the surface, it looks like we only have three turns. But if we're exploiting enemy weaknesses or using yielding our turns, we're essentially going to be able to have up to six attacks. There's also an item in game. I believe Guardian takes one crystal, but if you have that accessory equipped, it's going to make Guardian take half a crystal. As I mentioned earlier, using your turns effectively is going to be key. 
And now one way that we can do this, I said we can get up to six turns, which is gonna be double the amount of crystals. And we're gonna get that by exploiting weaknesses or yielding our turns, which I wouldn't really count as a turn. So I'd say mainly by getting crits and hitting weaknesses. Now, once we have the enemy weakness, we know that this boss, the weakness is ice. So I can just use ice, you know, get my half crystal, boom. And now we're going into uh, Hulkenberg. But with Hulkenberg, I don't have that inherited ability. Now, one thing that I wanna show you guys that you can really take advantage of are gonna be your magic items. You can buy these in this shop here, but only at nighttime. So I recommend you stock up on all of those. So that way you have a different ways to hit enemy weaknesses for your units that don't necessarily have that elemental ability. It is pretty early on. So 150 is actually a lot of damage in the early game. But we can see that right now, if I throw this ice chunk, which I bought from that store, it's going to essentially do magic damage and allow me to get that extra turn on Hulkenberg to do damage without just yielding my turn. So I essentially got three different attacks and now I have three more to come, all because I was able to abuse the items. So I really recommend you guys stock up on a lot of these so that way it can help you out in case you get in a pinch or maybe you don't have mage or the exact elemental weakness to exploit the enemy. With these items in stock, you're always gonna have the element to exploit it. And then just another quick hit, if you attempt to attack and you miss or the opponent blocks, that's gonna cost you two crystals and the same thing is gonna happen on the opposite side when they're attacking you. I plan to be making a ton of metaphor guides exactly like the one you're watching right now. So if you plan to play the game, I really would appreciate it if you consider subscribing to the channel and helping me get this video to 100 likes, but let's get back to helping you with combat. Now there's also positioning where we have front line and we have the back line. And you can see that when we move to the front, we're gonna get a melee attack boost, but our defense is gonna be lowered. And then when we move to the back, that's gonna be flipped where our defense is gonna rise. So if you're doing abilities like with Hulkenberg on the knight class that are gonna taunt enemies, ideally you're gonna wanna be in this back line or when you're defending and you wanna take the least amount of damage as possible, you're gonna wanna do that in the back row instead of in the front row. Now the con of being in the back row is that your attack is gonna decrease, but I believe it also mentioned that you're gonna have a higher chance of missing attacks, which could potentially cost you two crystals. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're doing this strategically and not just hiding in the back row for no reason so you don't mess up and cost yourself a lot of crystals. The next strong thing in combat, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're exploiting are gonna be buffs and debuffs. And now in Metaphor Refantasio, they're actually gonna stack up to three times. And so right now I have attack down and we can see it on the goblin. I have it applied twice. And if I were to apply it another time, it would be three. But I applied this uh, Tarukaja to increase my attack just to show you that I can do it three times. And so when it's my turn again, we're gonna see that on my main character, my attack is actually gonna be boosted up to three times. And so this is something you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are taking advantage of. And this is gonna mean on your team as well as on the enemy. In the late game, when you get the abilities where you're able to raise the entire attack of your whole team and the entire defense of your whole team, those are gonna be very strong. But in the early game, you're gonna be restricted to buffs that only affect one target. So for instance, I can only increase the attack of one character on my team. So early game is gonna be extremely beneficial to just focus on things that are gonna be debuffing the enemy because now the entire party benefits from it. I lowered this goblin's attack two times, and so the entire party is gonna take less damage. Or if I lowered his defense three times, the entire, <laughs> they're taunting us, the entire party is going to do more damage because their defense is lowered. And this is gonna give you more benefit early game than just increasing the attack of a single character because the whole party is gonna be able to benefit from it. But late game, buffs are gonna be extremely powerful. If you've played any other Atlas game, you know take advantage of these buffs and debuffs. The last thing that I have for turn-based combat before we get into tips in the overworld is gonna be really pay attention to these synthesis abilities. Now you're gonna unlock different combinations based on which archetypes you have equipped. So mix and match things when you unlock new archetypes to see what synthesis abilities that gives you access to. Because at times it does take multiple crystals, but these are gonna be way stronger than your abilities that you have with just your base archetype or doing melee attacks. And this is gonna give you access to clear dungeons and mobs that you probably shouldn't be able to when you're under leveled. And so with this synthesis ability, bamboo splitter we get for having multiple warriors on the team, I'm gonna be able to do massive physical slash damage and I'm gonna get a turn icon backed if I deal a killing blow. So I can target this, make sure that I'm gonna kill it, boom, one tap it, almost 500 damage. And if I were to just do a diagonal slash, 
there's no way I'm coming close to that even if I do two of those since it took me two crystals. And then when you add to that, it gives you that additional turn icon. It's just something that can't be matched. And so this is an example specifically for the warrior class, but definitely look out for examples of how this same exact interaction could happen with other abilities when you mix and match different archetypes. Now, when it comes to overworld combat, each archetype is gonna have a different attack strings and different pros and cons it's gonna have when fighting monsters in the overworld. And another thing to keep in mind is that there are gonna be things that are called hero passives for archetypes, which are gonna be different buffs that you're gonna get with fighting in the open world. Now, specifically on the mage, and this is gonna be a very important ability to take advantage of, we have magic recovery, which is going to give you MP every time you defeat an enemy or stun an enemy in overworld combat. And so we know that in other Atlas games, when you run out of MP or SP, you just have to leave the dungeon and let the day transfer over to the next one. But this is going to allow you to stay longer should you run out of items to continuously restore your MP. And we can see that in a lot of these dungeons, once you get a little bit leveled up, there are going to be a lot of trash mobs that you can just walk up to and kill in the overworld to continue regenerating your MP. So that way you can stay in the dungeon longer. Now with Mage, it's easier because you have AOE attacks. But when you get on an archetype with a single target attack, you're gonna have to get good at picking off the weaker mobs in the overworld before you engage in combat with the bigger enemies that you're gonna need to stun. So we wanna make sure that we clear all the trash mobs and then engage into the enemies. So that way we can go into combat easier and not have to worry as much. And you can get killed in this overworld, so don't, don't really mess around with it. But we can see I've cleared all the weak mobs and now I can go in for the engage once I get the stun and begin combat. Now, I believe this was confirmed, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but if you don't kill those trash mobs, when you engage in combat that's turn-based in the squad battle, you're gonna have more mobs to fight because you didn't clear them. So clearing them in the overworld is gonna be crucial, so that way when you get into some of these dungeons where these mobs are extremely overpowered, now you're cutting it down to a little bit that you have to fight as opposed to we probably would have had five different mobs on here that we had to kill. These are all of my tips for mastering combat in Metaphor Re Fantasio. Thank you once again, Sega and Atlas for sponsoring this video. And if you haven't already, make sure that you give the demo a try and you can get Metaphor Re Fantasio available now using the link in the description down below. But if you want just a general beginner's guide, I'll have that video linked right here for you to check out next. If it's not there currently, just give it a few days and it'll be uploaded shortly. Thank you for your time and I'll catch you in the next one.